The lipid bilayer membrane is an extremely important structure that exists extensively inside our body. So we typically find these lipid bilayer membranes actually surrounding the cells and also enclosing the organelles found within those cells. Now, lipid bilayer membranes consist of two major biological molecules, lipids and proteins. Now, the lipids have two functions. Function number one is to actually create a semi-permeable barrier, a barrier that separates the inner aqueous environment from the outer aqueous environment. And function number two of lipids is to actually create a medium, an environment in which the proteins can actually dissolve in. Because ultimately, it's the proteins that carry out nearly all the other functions of that particular membrane. So remember, the proteins greatly diversify the functionality of cell membranes. They basically carry out processes such as signal transduction pathway, communication pathways. They actually move the molecules and particles across the cell membrane and they also create an energy storage system. For instance, when they create proton gradients, that creates a separation of charge between the two sides of the membrane, and within that separation of charge, we store energy, electric potential energy. Now, depending on the type of membrane that we're examining and depending on the functionality of that membrane, the mass ratio of lipids to proteins can basically differ. So it varies anywhere from 4 to 1 to 1 to 4. And to see what we mean by that, let's compare the plasma membrane found on myelinated nerve cells to the membrane that encloses mitochondria. So what's the function of a neuron? Well, the function of a neuron is to basically carry an action potential, to initiate an electrical signal and carry that signal, the action potential, along the axon. And so in many of our neurons, on many of our neurons, the plasma membrane is actually myelinated by using these special lipids because it's the lipids that create this insulation layer that basically increases the rate at which that propagation actually takes place because that signal can basically uh, jump from one node to the next node. And so because the function of the neuron and the plasma membrane on the neuron is to actually propagate that signal, we'll find a much higher amount of lipids compared to proteins. In fact, only about 18% of the plasma membrane of myelin neurons contains proteins by mass. On the other hand, if we study the membrane of mitochondria, we'll see that the function of this membrane is to actually produce high energy ATP molecules. And that involves moving many different types of molecules across the membrane, as well as creating proton gradients. And so what that means is this membrane is very, very active and it contains a high proportion of proteins. In fact, about 75% of proteins by mass is found within the membrane of mitochondria. But on average, if we examine the plasma membranes of the cells inside our body, we'll find about 50% of protein by mass. But it can basically vary anywhere from, let's say, 18 to 75 percent of protein by mass. It really depends on the actual function of that cell and the function of that membrane. Now, there are two categories of proteins that we can find in the membranes of our body. We have integral proteins and peripheral proteins. So what exactly is the difference between these two? Well, integral proteins are basically the proteins that remain permanently attached onto that membrane. And that's because these contain uh, areas of hydrophobic regions that can actually interact with the core hydrophobic region of that membrane, as we'll see in our discussion in just a moment. On the other hand, peripheral proteins cannot interact as well with that hydrophobic core of the membrane, and so these peripheral proteins can actually dissociate under certain processes. For instance, gap junctions that we'll typically find, let's say, between cardiac cells are examples of integral proteins, and these gap junctions do not actually dissociate 
from the cell membrane under normal conditions. We actually have to mix these integral proteins with some type of nonpolar solution, for example, a detergent, to actually remove those integral proteins. But the peripheral proteins can easily be removed by, for example, changing the pH or adding some type of uh, salt solution because what that does is it disrupts those ionic or hydrogen bonds that exist between the peripheral proteins and that cell membrane, as we'll see in just a moment. So we see that integral proteins bind to the membrane extensively via extensive hydrophobic regions. And we even have integral proteins that span the entire width of that bilayer membrane. And what that means is it basically transverses the entire width of that membrane. So this is an example of an integral protein. So is this one and so is this one. In this particular case and this case, it is a transmembrane protein because it spans the entire width, but in this case, it's not a transmembrane, but it's still an integral protein because it interacts extensively via hydrophobic interactions with the hydrophobic core of that membrane. So the portion of the protein within the core interacts via van der Waal forces, we call them dispersion forces, with the hydrocarbon tails of the phospholipids, these red structures shown in that diagram. Now, peripheral proteins, on the other hand, interact with the membrane less extensively. They don't have as much of that hydrophobic section to basically be able to interact in the same stabilizing way. And so what they do is they instead use the polar sections to basically interact either with the polar heads of the phospholipids or the polar regions found on the surface of these integral proteins. And because the cell membrane, or generally the membrane, basically predomin uh, predominantly exists of the hydrophobic core, we see that the peripheral proteins cannot interact very well with the membrane. And so due to these weaker interactions, peripheral proteins can readily dissociate from the membrane. In fact, well, uh, when we'll discuss the signal transduction pathways and we'll look at G proteins, we'll see that G proteins are examples of these peripheral proteins. They can actually dissociate from that membrane and then go, uh, go on and carry out some important type of process inside our body. So once again, integral proteins come in two types. We have transmembrane proteins that span the entire membrane and we also have these integral proteins that only partially interact with that particular hydrophobic region. That means they don't actually span the entire membrane as shown here. In either case, these integral proteins are attached permanently via these strong hydrophobic nonpolar interactions. And so what that means is by changing the pH or adding some type of salt, for instance, sodium chloride, these integral proteins cannot actually dissociate from the membrane. But in the case of peripheral proteins, which only interact via these polar regions by changing the pH or by adding some type of uh, salt solution, we actually disrupt those bonds and that can cause the dissociation of that particular protein. So two major types of proteins. Now we'll focus on this in much more detail in a future lecture, but let's discuss integral proteins and let's take a look at three specific examples that we have studied extensively. So let's discuss bacteria, rhodopsin, porin, and prostaglandin H2 synthase 1. And let's begin with bacteria, rhodopsin. Now, Bacteria rhodopsin is a transmembrane integral protein, and that means it spans the entire membrane. And these transmembrane proteins are found in special types of archaeal bacterial cells. Now, the function of this protein is to basically use the energy that is stored in light to basically create a proton gradient. So it moves protons from the inside to the outside of that cell. And by creating this proton gradient, what it does is it, is it synthesizes, it is able to synthesize high energy ATP molecules.
Now, if we examine the structure of this transmembrane protein, we'll see it consists of membrane spanning alpha helices. In fact, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these membrane spanning alpha helices. In fact, the predominant structure of transmembrane proteins inside our body actually consists of these membrane spanning helices. Now, the thing about these membrane-spanning alpha helices is they consist predominantly of hydrophobic nonpolar amino acids. Why? Well, because these alpha helices that basically create this cylindrical structure that allows the movement of these H plus ions, they contain the hydrophobic nonpolar regions or amino acids because they want to be able to interact and stabilize, uh, interact in a stabilizing way with the hydrophobic core, the red portion of that cell membrane. So we see that the structure of bacteria or adopsin consists largely of membrane spanning alpha helices that contain mostly nonpolar amino acids that can interact via nonpolar van der Waals interactions, lung dispersion forces with the hydrocarbon tails of these phospholipids. Now let's move on to a different type of transmembrane protein that instead of containing alpha helices contains beta pleated sheets. So even though we typically find membrane uh, spanning alpha helices within these transmembrane integral proteins, we also actually sometimes contain uh, find these beta pleated sheets. So let's discuss a specific example called porin. Now, porin is basically a transmembrane protein that exists in certain bacterial cells, for instance, uh, E. coli cells, and it exists on the outer membrane of those, uh, on the outer layer of the membrane of those bacterial cells. Remember, some cells have actually two membranes, and this porin exists on the outer membrane. Now, porin is actually a channel, so it's a pore, it's a hole inside the membrane. And what this consists of are these beta pleated sheets that run in an anti-parallel direction and they basically curl and create this channel. Now they create the channel because this, because the function of this is to basically move polar molecules across the cell membrane. In fact, the entire inner portion of the channel basically is filled with an aqueous solution with water molecules. And what that implies is, even though the outer portion of this porin structure basically consists of nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids so that they can interact well with the hydrophobic tails, the inner section of this porin actually must consist of these hydrophilic polar amino acids because the entire inner portion of the porin is filled with a water solution, an aqueous solution. So porin is an integral protein, more specifically a transmembrane integral protein because it spans the entire membrane. It's found in bacterial cells, for instance, E. coli cells. It acts as a channel, a pore, a hole, allowing certain molecules, polar molecules to actually pass across. Now, it consists predominantly of beta pleated sheets that run in an anti-parallel direction as shown here. So, one arrow goes here, the other arrow goes here, and it consists of alternating hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. The hydrophobic amino acids interact with the nonpolar uh, hyd uh, hydrocarbon tails of that membrane, while the polar, the hydrophilic amino acids, actually point inward into that porn, and that interacts with the aqueous solution and the polar molecules passing through that particular porn channel. Now, in fact, we have many examples of these channels inside our body. So, the example I mentioned earlier, the gap junctions that exist, for instance, in cardiac, mu uh, in, uh, uh, cardiac muscle cells, basically are these channels that allow the propagation, the movement of the ions, and that creates the movement of that action potential from one cardiac cell to the adjacent cardiac cell, and that creates a forceful and a strong contraction of the heart. And we have many other examples of these types of porins inside our body. For instance, we have aquaporins, which basically allow the movement of water molecules across the membrane.
Now the final example we're going to look at is the prostaglandin H2 synthase 1. And this is actually an example of an integral protein that is not a transmembrane protein. And what that means is it doesn't actually span the entire width of the membrane, but it does contain a good portion that actually does interact with that core. And that's why we call it an integral protein. So if we basically change our pH or add a salt solution, this will not dissociate because a good portion of it actually is permanently bound to that cell membrane. Now, where do we find these uh, molecules? Well, typically we find them in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And this portion basically points into the aqueous environment of the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the cytoplasm and this is the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what's the function of this protein? Well, actually, unlike in this particular case, this is an enzyme. So it actually catalyzes a specific reaction.